uh, they're getting to a point where we're starting to be concerned with the structural integrity of the grid material. And we're also starting to be concerned with the influence upon the transparency of the grid. Okay. The grid in question is a grid like this. This is the same grid that's currently flying on the Solar Probe Cup uh, as part of the Parker Solar Probe. It's a tungsten grid. And it's 90% transparent. That means that the ratio of open area within the gridded section is 90% of the total area. Okay? Scientists are pushing for thinner and thinner wires and larger and larger spacings. They want to preserve as much charge density from the solar wind and other charged particle flows as possible. Okay? Those transparencies, uh, this is 90% transparent. Uh, the grid that Team 1 uh, did a full mapping on is 94% transparent. And we've seen some things uh, during our evaluation of the grids uh, after the chemical etching process is completed that are of concern to us. And so Teams 1 and Team 2 uh, have both developed systems that are going to help us. They're going to help us understand what the detailed dimensions of the actual wire geometries are. And they're actually, they're going to measure in a very high resolution, uh, down to a two micron resolution, what the widths on these wires are. All right? And both the systems from Team 1 and Team 2 are going to be instrumental uh, when we begin to do work as part of the Helioswarm project, which is going to be managed, it was recently selected by NASA, and it's going to be managed out of the University of New Hampshire. Okay. So we have a 10 minute introductory video. Um, I hope that it will be informative. I hope it will give you additional insight into the challenge that team one and team two, as well as team five, the remote team had during the course of their projects. Uh, if you have any questions regarding anything you see or hear on the video, uh, I am certainly available you know, during the intermission. Come on up to me, ask me anything you like. I'll be more than happy to, to answer your question. Okay. And may I add that having been the sort of the lead instructor for Team 1, Team 2, and Team 5, I'm very proud of all teams. They have worked really hard. And I think you, you will see uh, in the quality of their presentation, in the quality of their results, that they've done an amazing job uh, measuring and evaluating uh, the, this very important charge particle uh, component. So you can go ahead with the video. Good evening. Three engineering capstone project teams have developed measurement systems which quantify important characteristics of Faraday cup grids. Before their projects are presented, we'd like to provide you with an introduction into the typical configuration and operation of a Faraday cup instrument. We hope this introduction will also offer insight into the critical functions that Faraday cup grids provide in this type of charge particle instrumentation. The Faraday cup was named for Michael Faraday, who first theorized the existence of ions in the 1830s. The cup is just that, a conductive cup which collects charged particles in a vacuum. The instrument consists of two assemblies, a modulator assembly in the front and a collector assembly just aft of the modulator. Charged particles enter the cup through its external aperture and arrive at the outer grids. These outer grids are electrically grounded to provide a null electric field. This field provides two functions. It isolates the inner workings of the Faraday cup from external sources of electromagnetic interference, and it preserves the flow velocities and directions of the particles entering the cup. The modulator itself acts like a charge particle filter. It does this by providing a modulating potential energy field at the high voltage grid. An example of this modulation can be seen here in the right hand view. Uh, that particular instrument utilized a square wave modulation at a modulation frequency of 200 hertz. 
Particles that possess a kinetic energy that is less than the potential energy established by voltage V1 are retired by the high voltage grid and not allowed to pass through the grid and into the collector. Particles that have a kinetic energy greater than the potential energy set by voltage V2 are allowed to pass through the grid and into the, the collector assembly. These particle currents are filtered out within the signal processing electronics. It is the remaining particles, those with kinetic energies within the potential energies set by V1 and V2 that are of interest. This band of energy levels is called the energy range or energy window. Particles that enter the collector assembly pass through a series of grounded grids and their charge is dis deposited onto a triangular or quadrant array of metal plates. The currents are extracted from these collector plates and pass through preamplifier networks and into signal processing electronics. The current measurements indicate the number of particles reaching the collector plates each modulation cycle. Faraday cups have been used in laboratories and have flown on various space platforms. An example of its laboratory application is the Kimball Physics Faraday Cup FC-73 shown on the left here. This is a small commercially available Faraday cup which measures the flux emanating from ion emission sources such as ion guns. Faraday cups have flown in space for decades, starting with the Voyager plasma science instrument in the late 1970s, the solar wind experiment on the wind spacecraft in 1994, and more recently, the Sweep solar probe cup currently orbiting the sun on board the Parker solar probe. A popper, popular use of Faraday cups in space is measuring the constituents of the solar wind which are charged particle flows resulting from coronal mass ejections from the sun's surface. These ejections are also known as solar flares. You've heard me refer to grids during my description of the Faraday cup configuration and operation. An important performance related characteristic of a grid is its transparency shown here as T sub G. The grid to the left has wire widths around 50 microns and wire spacings of about 100, excuse me, 1,000 microns or one millimeter. Given these values of W and S, the theoretical transparency of this grid is slightly more than 90%. If you were to look down into a Faraday cup, you would notice that each grid is ro rotated by approximately 15 degrees with respect to the grid immediately above it. In this arrangement, we can approximate the transparency or total transmission of the cup uh, to be T sub G raised to the power N, where N is the number of grids in the system. This means that a grid transparency variation of only 1% can result in a variation of 8% in total transmission through the cup a non-trivial value when considering the small currents being extracted for the, from the collector plates. The total grid transparency has never been measured, but given its sensitivity to total throughput of the cup, the time has come to pay more attention to this critical performance characteristic. In order to develop a transparency measurement system, we needed grids to support this development. We were fortunate that, upon hearing of CETA's desire to develop a grid transparency measurement system, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory donated six solar probe cup tungsten grids for use by the CETA capstone teams. These grids are fabricated by chemically etching uh, metal foil. Uh, these foils can be as thin as 50 microns. This etch etching process is typically a vendor proprietary process, uh, and we had been uh, previously informed that the etching was done by uh, or done in two directions in order to ensure uh, flat sidewalls of each pore. What we soon learned under microscopic evaluation, uh, as you see here on the left hand side, is that there was a significant taper in the wire geometry. That inner gray uh, bar uh, within the darkened section, that is the top surface uh, of the grid wire. 
So we not only noticed that there was significant tapering from the bottom side of the grid to the top side of the grid, but we also noticed uh, that there was significant thinning of the broad base uh, of the wire or the bottom of the wire as shown here uh, by the darker outline. So we, we were faced with a situation where we not only had to uh, measure the grid uh, wire characteristics and spacings uh, to determine uh, what the transparencies were, we also had to measure uh, at very high resolution uh, what those minimum wire widths were uh, in order to uh, adequately verify the structural integrity uh, of the grid. A few years ago, a local aerospace engineering company, ASSDC LLC, designed and fabricated components of a prototype Faraday cup sensor for the University of Michigan. The desire for this prototype sensor was that it would have a highly interchangeable design and would also allow for quick assembly. This design uh, intent was confirmed when the Faraday cup sensor prototype uh, was uh, assembled by a small group of uh, University of Michigan students uh, within the span of, of one day. Uh, in 2019, the University of Michigan requested ACSDC LLC to transfer the prototype cup design to SAO uh, as SAO wanted to use that design as part of its pr proposal uh, to NASA for the Helios One project. Uh, we were very excited to hear that uh, a couple months ago, uh, the Helios One project was selected by NASA for implementation. ACES DC LLC is slated to provide the grid assemblies for the Helios One instruments that are to be built and tested by SAO. And if the capstone measurement systems are successful, ACES DC LLC intends to use them to inspect and measure the Helios Warm grid. So one note I would add is if you look uh, on the photograph on the left-hand side of the, the slide, you can see the faint outline of the quadrant uh, collector plates uh, in the bottom uh, of the prototype Faraday cup sensor. And if you look in the lower left quadrant uh, where there is higher illumination uh, due to local lighting, you might also be able to make out uh, the grid pattern uh, with uh, four modulator grids stacked on top of four collector grids. And so this evening, there will be three presentations of grid measurement systems. Team one will present their high resolution imaging system, which uses two axis motion control of the grid and allows their high resolution camera to capture images of all four cores and then allows image processing to occur on each one of those four images to determine four transparencies and then an overall total transparency of the grid. Team two will present their scanning confocal laser system. This system scans the outer pore wires where they intersect to the solid sort of solid border of the grid and it performs high resolution measurements of wire widths at those critical locations. Team five will then present their inductive sensor system which is used to characterize the resonance and the transmissibility or dynamic response of the grids. We hope you enjoy all of the engineering capstone project presentations this evening, and we thank you for your attendance and participation. I'm Justin Smith, and presenting with me will be Ethan Page. And then also on our team is Timothy Cabral, Alex Matarazzo, and Robert Missyag. 
So tonight we'll be uh, going over our project. So we're going to be focusing on uh, our prototype, as you can see here. Uh, it's the one in the middle, uh, the big white box. <laughs> um, and then we'll also be looking at our testing results and uh, what we got as a result of our testing. So uh, we got a description from Professor Dagno about the uh, Faraday Cup grids and how they function. So our task as a team was to develop an automated process to be able to measure these grids, and for which there is no previous design or uh, machine to be able to do that. And we we're tasked to measure them and be within a 1% accuracy. As you mentioned, uh, small inaccuracies can add up in these Faraday cup grids. So looking at the two different grids that we had over the course of the year. So the first one that we were uh, working with in Capstone 1 was a 4-inch grid. Uh, as you mentioned, was the tungsten grid. And this was at 4 inches in diameter. And we used this to do our preliminary testing, look at our camera, and kind of test out our software. And as we got into semester 2, we looked at a 6-inch grid, uh, which is here on the bottom. And this is a stainless steel grid. And it has slightly different dimensions in the wires and the spacings. Uh, but this is the one that we're actually verifying our system with and uh, verifying our requirements. All right, so looking at our requirements. So as we uh, developed our project, we have to outline our project and what we actually want to accomplish. Uh, the two major ones that I'm going to point out here is the, as I mentioned before, the grid transparency. Uh, we have to be able to measure this within a 1% accuracy. Uh, that is critical to the function of these. So that is going to be our main target, and that's going to drive our design throughout the semester and the duration. So we want this automated system to be able to operate and do a full scan, a full measurement within one working day or eight hours. And as you can see here, we have... Um, we have gotten our performance to be a 0.1% accuracy, and we have gotten our cycle time to 3.3 .3 hours, so three and a half hours. So we have met these uh, two requirements. So looking at kind of how the system is going to operate as we're um, functioning it and using it on a daily basis. So we uh, have the grid mounted, you go through all of that, and then we start our program. And it will go to the first uh, pour that we have uh, decided in our system. It will go capture an image. And then from there, it will do two things. It will check if it, that's the last pour that we have to take a picture of. If it's not, it will move to the next pour that we have. And while it's doing that, we will be uh, um, calculating the wire widths and the wire spacings and calculating the transparency and recording that data simultaneously. And this will repeat until we have captured all, I think it's 1,396 pores in the 6-inch grid. So looking a little bit at our functional block diagram, so this is looking at um, what our system consists of. Uh, mainly, we have a, a backlight, and we have our computer uh, talking with an Arduino to power uh, our stepper motors and our uh, XY motion table. We also have the computer capturing images, talking with the camera, and then doing the computations in the background to calculate those transparencies that we need. So looking at our, uh, our prototype here. So uh, up here, we call this the dome. So in here, we have our camera that we have selected. And we also have a z-axis adjust. So we are able to adjust the focus as needed. So if we have to change mountings or anything, we are able to adjust the focus as we need. And then um, the big white box. So this is uh, key to block out ambient light. Uh, if we have ambient light, we get a lot of reflections off of the grid. So this is to ensure that uh, that won't interfere with our image capturing and then our data processing. Moving down here, the two silver um, plate or the silver plates in the middle, this is our grid mounting. So we currently have a grid mounted in here. So during the intermission, you can come up and look at how it's going to be mounted. And then on that is on our uh, motion 
uh, subsystem, which will translate the grid in the X and Y direction. So we're able to look at and capture images of all the pores. So our electrical schematic. So the picture on the right uh, shows from the back. We have a back panel that will open up and it will show all of our electronics. Uh, the major notes is we have a power supply with some step downs to power our light source and some auxiliary uh, electronics. And this is all neatly uh, packaged up away so it's not gonna interfere with any of our scans or any of our motion. So our mechanical design. So starting with our motion table, we have uh, NEMA 11 stepper motors, and this is just a classification of stepper motors. And we were able to achieve a resolution of about 12 and a half uh, microns, which was hugely beneficial to be able to navigate and be able to center the pores in our image and our camera to be able to get effective scans and transparency calculations. And then our uh, grid mounting, uh, we were actually working with our uh, customer to develop mounts that were uh, very similar or identical to the ones actually used in industry so we won't damage the grid at all during our uh, process. So looking at our image capturing, so this is the, the most important part of our project. So initially we started off with I think it was about a three and a half uh, micron pixel size. So that's the size in which one pic pixel represents. And through testing, uh, we upgraded to a 2.2 micron pixel size. So this is, allows us to be able to get more accurate readings and accurate data on the actual widths of the wires and everything. And um, another huge uh, important requirement that we met and we uh, exceeded by far was our frame rate. So originally we wanted to achieve uh, one frame per second. And this is mainly because we have to go through and take 1300 pictures. And we are, are on a time limit and we were able to get six and a half frames per second. So that reduced our cycle time uh, significantly. So just looking at kind of a list of our fabricated items, all of this is fabricated in-house and designed in-house by uh, our team. And we used uh, 3D prints. This big gray dome was printed on our 3D printer. And that was about the max size we could get. The uh, enclosure, so the white is all PVC and manufactured in-house. We used the uh, machines downstairs in the machine shop to be able to machine. Uh, a lot of these parts in the base here, a lot of the metal is all machined in-house. And looking at as we uh, work through our fabrication integration, um, some of the main ones I'll point out is the top right. So that this was the first time that we actually were able to get a working stage with our uh, stepper motor drives. Uh, this was a huge moment. I think this was last semester and we were able to get motion to be able to translate the grid. And then in the bottom right, we have our six inch grid mount. Uh, as you can see, we have quite a few up here and we have had many more in between. Uh, this is a huge development process for us continuing to, to get that design that we needed to have it perform the way we wanted. And again, looking at our grid mount, so the left side is our, uh, is our design at the CDR. So this was at the beginning of this semester. And just looking how it translated into our actual design, uh, we followed that pretty well and it worked. And we have our, the six inch grid assembly in there and it's currently working and we've run uh, full scans with it. So at this point I will hand the presentation off to Ethan Page. All right, so after we put the system together, we moved on to testing. Uh, the outline of the test that we followed is shown here. So the first test we did was an absolute uh, system calibration. I say test, but it's really more of a check. So the purpose of this was to verify that our system was performing as expected with our 1% uncertainty. Um, so what we did was we measured this pour here, pour 121. I should also note that each pour is addressable by its Cartesian coordinates. So pour 121 is one from this red center line and 21 up. All right, so we measured that 
and then we took our values and compared it to the nominal values. Uh, the same poll was measured at 192 um, by our customer. So our test was successful if we had less than a 0.2% difference. Now our requirement was 1%, but I'm saying 0.2 here. So the point of this was if we were with the outside of our 0.2%, uh, we could go into our calibration. Um, but actually, the first test we ran, we were spot on. We had less than a 0.1% difference. Um, now, if we had failed this test, we move on to calibration. So the nice part about image processing is that we have uh, variables like thresholds. So we can adjust the transparency based off of the threshold value. So our nominal value you know, at 192 was 94%. And that corresponds to a threshold value of 70. And so that's what we use for the rest of our, our scans. The next test was a range of motion test. The purpose of this was to ensure that we could capture all four pores with our motion table. We performed this test by manually jogging to all extreme one pores and ensuring that they all fit in the camera as seen here. And this test was successful. After that test, we moved on to a baseline performance test. Now the main purpose of this test was to ensure that we could actually complete a full sweep. Um, the success being that we could complete a full sweep and calculate the total transparency. So we completed this first test on uh, April 10th, and we found the total transparency was 93.6% on the grid. So after we complete a sweep, this is an example of the data that is shown to the customer. On the top left here is the data captured for each pore. So the first thing we do is capture this grayscale image. And then using, um, using some sort of thresholding technique, we convert it to this uh, white image here. And from there, we calculate the wire widths and the wire spacing, and that gives us our transparency values. So we do 210 measurements along each wire. So 210 here and 210 here. And so this only shows the first six. So this is a big text file. Now we do this for each individual pore. So we have about two gigabytes of output data at the end of the day. Um, now when we've completed the scan, a histogram shows. And this shows the average transparency as well as the most frequent. And the next slide goes to show why we have this kind of weird little double bump here. So talking to our customer, we really wanted to come up with a metric for how well these, these uh, grids were, were built. And on the left is a 3D plot of the uh, pores and their transparencies are on the z-axis. Now it's hard to show a 3D image uh, in 2D, so on the right you can see really the trends that we saw. And so as we, as we scan from left to right, we notice that there's quite a drop off on transparency. Now, we're, the customer was very interested to see this. And what happens is with this drop off of, tra off of transparency, it means the wires are getting wider, which means there's more material. And so that is something we went to the customer and told them that we saw. And we're curious to see if this trend continues with multiple grids. So after our baseline test, we moved on to a micro vibration test. The point of this was to make sure that you know, any sort of vibration wouldn't hinder the performance of our system. We performed this test by capturing 50 images of the same pore as fast as possible. We then calculated the transparency for each pore, and we looked at the standard deviation between transparencies. The result, this test was successful if we had less than a 0.15% deviation, and the test results out of the 50 pores was 0.01%, so we, we deemed this test, you know, passed. After we did that test, we moved on to a repeatability test. Now, the main purpose of this was to ensure that the transparency value doesn't change on the same pore as we move about. So we did this test by moving to a pore, capturing an image of it. We then found the transparency. We moved off the pore and back onto the pore. And you can see that when we come back onto the pore, we're not quite at the same location. And so we wanted to make sure that even though we were shifted a little bit, the transparency was still the same. 
So our success criteria was, again, that we were less than 0.15% um, variation in this transparency. And the results of our test are shown with a 0.07% absolute difference. Um, we met this test. After this, we performed a system temperature test. The point of this was to make sure that our internal temperature didn't exceed the maximum operating temperature of our camera, and that is 60 degrees C. So we ran a whole scan, and then once the scan was complete, we measured the three critical uh, elements shown uh, to get their temperature. Now, the hottest part of the system is the backlight, um, but that was well below our maximum temperature, and we were very pleased with that. One of our last tests was a final system performance. And the point of this was to ensure that any previous testing didn't change our actual performance. And so we just ran a full scan again and looked at the difference between that initial baseline test and the final test. Our success criteria here was that we were within 0.3% of, to um, of the initial transparency. And so the initial transparency was 93.66. And once we did the, the final scan, we uh, observed 93.79, which was a 0.15% absolute difference. Uh, our CIS was verified in this respect. The last test, and this is a test that we're going to run every single time, is a relative system uh, calibration. So the point of this is to ensure that there is no de like unacceptable deviation in performance during a full scan, meaning that as we scan left to right, we don't you know, pick up some inherent bias and that affects our readings. So we do this test by going through a full scan and then going back and remeasuring the first five pores. This test is, is successful if there is less than a 0.3% difference between our initial transparency values and then the final transparency values of those five same pores. And the outline, the uh, results of these tests are shown the greatest absolute difference was on this negative 21.3 poor, and it was 0.07%. Um, so our system was fully verified at this point. So this is our verification matrix. This is what we followed um, during testing. Now the items on top are the tests that, we, that I just talked about, and this was done at the system level. But it's important to note that during every stage of you know, design and of putting this uh, system together, we performed tests on various subsystems. Um, and we did a lot of tests, as you can see, with all the green blocks. So we knew going into the full system test that we were in a good spot. Um, and it was really nice to see that all these system level tests were you know, beating expectations by a great amount. The school awarded us a $3,000 budget, and of that, we spent roughly 81% of it. Um, and we've, we're proud of that, too. <laughs> we learned a lot throughout this project. Uh, one of the biggest ones was that it's a good idea to schedule ambitious but achievable deadlines. That really kept us on track and allowed us to finish early um, and, you know, we went through a couple iterations of, of grid mounts. So the fact that we were ahead of schedule gave us the time to get these prints in and test them. And it really took a lot of uh, stress away. Um, it was also a good lesson that we, you know, consider societal and economic impacts. This was something that is part of ABET. And, you know, we were taught this and it was a, a great uh, thing to consider on how our design could impact the world. Um, so that was another lesson learned. So our system is pretty amazing, um, but there is room for improvement. Um, one of the biggest ones is to try to find a backlight that uses less power. The main source of heat comes from that backlight, and that was a concern of ours. Um, so if we were to improve the system, that would probably be the number one thing we could do. And at this point, I would like to open it up to any questions you have about the system, about the grids, anything at all. Professor Guo. First of all, congratulations. Nice job. Thank you. Um, a couple questions. Um, First, um, you, you mentioned you might have a vibrations when you move 
the grids around. So did you measure how, how big that is or what's the impact? So the purpose of the micro vibration test was to uh, see if the micro vibrations, not when we were moving, but just, you know, uh, anything from any machines running would affect. And we, measure, we didn't measure the vibrations themselves, more the effect they had on the transparency, right? So, you know, if we had vibrations that caused a distortion in the image, we would see that in a variation in transparency. Um, but since we saw such little variation, we determined that our system could account for the small, low-level vibrations that are inherent. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question is, you mentioned the grid has different transparency from left to right, right? That's tendency. And uh, I ever think, right, you talk to the customer to find out if that's you no know, manufacturer, right, deviation or that's you no know, measurement deviation. Um, did you ever try other ways, like you, know, you try different grades and they all behave the same? Or you know, the way you measure the grades from left to right or left right for left, does it have an impact on that measurement as well? So we haven't done a lot of rotation on the grid. We only have this one grid to measure, unfortunately. That would be another test that we'd love to run to see if this you know, bias is consistent with multiple grids. Um, but we have, I haven't run the, the system with the grid rotated the other way. Um, I can do that. I'd be curious actually to see what it would look like. Okay, thank you. Um, my third question would be, right, you mentioned the backlight could be the biggest right, uh, source for the, uh, for the heat. Yep. Uh, did you might think of install of a ventilation fans or something like that? We did consider that idea. We've... We accounted for the problem by cycling the backlight. So we only have the backlight on for about the half a second it takes to capture an image. When we're actually moving the grid, we turn the backlight off. We were concerned with fans for any sort of uh, vibration or you know, moving the grid while it's moving you know, more than we needed to. Uh, we were trying to avoid that um, if we could, and we found out that we could. That is an option had the backlight you know, not been able to maintain its temperature that we would have pursued. Okay, thank you. Uh, my last question will be related to teamwork. I know you've been through two semesters long, right? Almost nine months of you no know, duration, and uh, I know you know pe right people can wait off, and uh, you know it's time for for you to graduate and so on. And uh, how do you handle right uh, the teamwork, and how do you handle uh, the maybe some internal conflict? Yeah, I mean, the biggest part is communication. And that was one of our lessons learned. I didn't explicitly talk about it. But, you know, constant communication between the team was really key in how well we work together. And, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's my questions. I only have two. Not <laughs> <laughs> when you jog across the, the uh, screen, it does, it's not obvious to me that that you actually have to maintain absolute precision in terms of position. Once you get to the desired spot, can't you recenter um, to reset for any errors in jogging across the, the length? Yeah, so when we, when we were discussing jogging, that was to find the extremum and also to move to that specific uh, poor. That was the poor 121. Now, when we do the scan, the system will automatically Pick out, can you pull to the picture of the grid? Yeah. So we jogged to this value to get our absolute calibration values. Now when we do a full scan, we set the grid in like it is shown here, and then we center this first point. We then move to this point here, and we manually enter that. That's our second form of calibration. From these two values, it maps every single pore. Right, so it automatically will go to this first starting pore and scan all the way without us touching anything. So the only time we jog is for that initial calibration, um, but when we actually do the scan, it's automatically finding each pore, which is why that resolution was needed. Okay, and then um, with respect to the backlight and the cycling, do you, do you calibrate against the intensity? How do you check that the backlight intensity isn't changing pulse to pulse? That's a good question, too. So 
the refresh rate of the backlight itself was uh, much higher than the cycle rate, um, so I'm not worried there. Now, when we were doing our testing, we were playing with different exposure times, and we wanted to keep the exposure time as small as possible so that the effect of any sort of micro vibrations was minimal. Um, and now, when we were doing our testing, our cycle time was long enough on the backlight was long enough that we didn't see any um, cycling in the backlight itself. If that makes sense, right? So when it was on, it was a solid on. Yeah, but you so so you had some light intensity measurement that you could you could assure yourself that every sing, that 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 light had the same intensity every single time. I did not have that. Um, we did do auto expose measurements. The camera was really nice in that aspect to measure the intensity. Well, yeah. to measure the ex auto exposure on each extremum of the of the, Got the it. backlight itself. Um, now, as for when we turn on and off the backlight, I did not measure the intensity each time there. Okay. Thank you. This beautiful work. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I would just like to reiterate what Dean Colin Brander just mentioned. Uh, this uh, team did an outstanding job. Look at the numbers. Look at the accuracies. They they not only got one percent. They're they're knocking on the door of point one percent. They did an absolutely magnificent job. So now keep in mind these these wires are what hundred microns. That's what. Uh, that's a tenth of a millimeter. Like, uh, pretty cool. Well, thank you very much for listening. We appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carlos Baez. I'm a part of Grid Team 2. And tonight, we will be delivering our project presentation. Co-presenting with me will be Jasper Koza. As well as on our team, we have Tyler Smith, Ryan Desalniers, Matthew Richards, and Michael Moreno, who cannot be here with us tonight. A brief overview of what we'll be going over tonight. We will be speaking about all of the activities that led to our system design. We'll then go over fabrication integration, our testing, and we'll wrap up testing and some conclusions. So our customer came to us at the beginning of Capstone 1 with a problem. They had a need for a system that could, autom that could measure these charged particle instrument grids in an automated fashion that represented a low cost to them. Currently on the market, there are a couple of systems that can make these types of measurements. However, they do have a very high cost and are not fully automated. So just a quick overview of our grids, as you have seen in the previous presentation by Team One and the video beforehand. These grids are stacked within a Faraday cup instrument. Um, they're used to filter charged particles that are coming into the system. Now highlighted by the red dots that you see on the grid, that is the area that our system is focusing on measuring. So a little deeper into that system, um, we are specifically measuring the north, south, east, and west quadrants. At each one of these quadrants we'll be measuring, we've measured nine different wires along those quadrants. Now the big importance that we 
the big factor that made us measure those edges is our system using that confocal laser that you'll learn a little more about later can is able to detect the uncertainties within the fillets of the wires. So that is very important for our customers. That is the point where maximum failure could occur on these grids. Now a bit about our project, a project description for you. So our system we designed to measure the outer border and wires of the wires. Um, our, sister can, our system can measure the 36 wires along the borders. And as you can see here, we have the laser sensor head and the grid assembly shown. A concept of operation for our system, so our primary stakeholder was ACES DC LLC. Primary user are going to be scientists that are studying charged particle instruments, and our system will feature an automatic and a manual operating mode. Some design considerations that we had, the primary one being economic, we want to decrease the cost of measuring CPI instruments. As well as for public and health, we wanted to decrease the ocular strain that could come to inspection personnel measuring these grids. Throughout the design of our system, we had a lot of requirements, some of which were provided by the customers, others that we derived based on the performance that we wanted to see of our system. From those, we then derived our driving requirements for our system, which are shown here. We have met all of those requirements, and the margins to which we met them are shown here as well. So moving into our system design, from a top view of our system, you can see our base plate, which holds everything together for our system. You can then see the laser support structure, the laser sensor head, our motion control board, and our power supply for the system. From a front view, you can now see the axes. So we have an X, a Y, and a rotary axis used for alignment of the grid for measurements. We have the grid mounting rings provided by our customer. You can then get a front view of the laser support structure and the sensor head again. A little more about those grid mounting rings. So these were provided to us as they simulate the clamping force that the grids see on the live um, systems. Now you can see on the bottom and on the left hand side that they do have perpendicular scribes. Those are used by our system to align the grid for proper measurements along the wires. A bit of an operational overview of our system. Um, our system determine the determines the position of the edge wires from the light intensity measurements that it takes. It makes at least eight measurements of each wire along the wire, and the system automatically measures nine wires in each quadrant. Our system block diagram here. So our system receives 120 volts of AC power from the wall, which then gets converted to 24 volts of DC power that gets distributed to our laser control unit, our motion control unit, and our data processing unit. On our electrical side, shown here, you can see how everything is connected together. So starting with the 24 volts that uh, was converted, then gets sent over to our motion control board, which then will power the three stepper motors that our system uses to move, as well as the power that gets sent over to our laser displacement meter that measures the wires. So throughout our design phase of our system, we had to make many trade-offs, some of which are not shown here due to spacing. Um, the main trade-offs that we had to make was right at the beginning of our project, we had to choose what kind of measurement system we wanted to use. And we chose to go with a confocal laser system for the measurements. We also, in the beginning, decided to use RS-232 serial communication for how our software will interface with our system. And something that was decided upon during the second semester of Capstone was adding a rotary axis for better alignment of those wires for measurement. Right here we have our verification matrix. I am proud to say that we have completed all of our 
testing requirements and all of our tests that we had conducted. As shown here, on the top level, you have the system level testing that we did. And below that, you see all the subsystem and then individual component testing that we did for everything that we built. Moving on to our risk assessments. So throughout the design process, we identified many risks that could become, that could affect our system as we went on. The three primary risks that we identified we have here, and we, on the top matrix, you will see the risk and its impact to our system pre-mitigation. And then on the bottom matrix, we show the impact that those risks could have on our system after we Im implemented some mitigation. For our budget, the School of Engineering allotted us a budget of $3,000. We have spent $2,700 to date, and that is our estimate at completion as we have finished all work on our system. And from now, I'll pass this over to Jasper, who will take you to the fabrication and integration. Good evening, everyone. All right, so first I'm gonna talk about our fabrication and integration. And so we fabricated all components of our system in-house. The first four listings here are all machined aluminum components out of Mike 6 uh, tooling jig plate. Our housing and um, uh, safety equipment is made out of PVC sheeting, similar to Team 1's. And uh, we have some 3D printed components inside that are hard to see, but uh, the laser mount is one of those. Um, and that allows us to adjust the laser vertically with some slots. The base of our system is a large 18 by 20 inch, uh, 3 quarters inch thick aluminum sheet that provides a good mass uh, for vibration isolation, as well as a nice sturdy base for everything to come off of. The manufacturer specified that the material would be less than five thousandths of an inch flat, and we measured it at two thousandths of an inch flatness, which is uh, excellent for our tolerance stack up that I'll be talking about moving forward here. The image on the left shows our motion axes in a close up view. We can see the y axis lead screw here, x axis going this way, and then our rotary axis and grid mounting rings up at the top. All of these components were manufactured in-house, and the manufacturing process was kept as precise as possible because of that tolerance stack up for laser uh, depth of focus reasons. I mentioned that the housing is made out of PVC sheeting, and this is the most non-critical part of the system. It is primarily used for safety, as well as uh, protection of the grid samples um, due to debris or, or foreign objects. And as we saw from the top view of our system, our electronics are housed on a shelf at the top uh, rear side of the system in the back here. We also do have an electronics access panel um, that will be seen, um, that was seen, I think, on the previous slide, right? Yeah. Um, so that way we can access those electronics if needed. The motion control board on, oops, sorry. Motion control board here on the left-hand side um, is a 3D printer control board, actually. So that allows us to use industry standard G-code for our motion control systems. Now we're going to talk about system performance, as well as a little bit of an overview of our laser sensor. Some of the key specifications of this sensor are that it has a horizontal resolution of 2 micrometers and a scan width of up to 1,100 micrometers, or 1.1 millimeters. That allows us to measure wires that would be theoretically up to about one millimeter in width. Also, I mentioned depth of focus. So that is the 300 micrometer uh, value here. And that is the vertical distance that the laser is in focus. So we need to keep the grid within that distance at all times throughout the entire range of motion of the grid. That's why the manufacturing process for all the components uh, had to be kept as precise as possible. An overview of how our automatic scanning works. 
Here is a software flow diagram. We start with a automatic calibration of the laser and aligning the grid. Then we move to our first position and check if that's the last position, which immediately the answer is no. However, as we move through the scanning, that will eventually end our scan. At each position, we measure at least eight times on each wire fillet, and that allows us to find the narrowest location of that fillet um, as the wire is tapering down from the border into the uh, straight section of the wire. I mentioned that the grid gets automatically aligned. We use this with our rotary axis, the third axis that we added this semester. Um, and so to do that, we first measure two positions close to each other on the wire, of, on a wire of the grid. And then we, move, we calculate an angle from those two close positions to estimate where the end of the grid is going to be. Then we move to the end of the grid, take another measurement, and we use those two extremum locations to calculate the most accurate angle that we can of the wires within the grid. As Team 1 and Professor Dano mentioned, um, there is significant tapering to the wires. So we know, uh, identified this early on as a possible source of error in our measurements. So we did some testing with both the grid right side up as well as upside down. And we can see from our averages and standard deviations that the, the two directions are nearly identical. So for this reason, we decided to measure with the grid right side up, as that way there is a vertical scribe line to mark the north indicated location of the grid. And that is helpful for alignment of the grid when we're setting up the system. We performed a microvibration analysis of our system build table. Here on the right, uh, left, sorry, we can see the plot of uh, vibration measured. We can see the peak here on the left hand, uh, left -hand side of the plot um, is around three and a half, four micrometers. So that is greatly exceeding our two micrometer resolution requirement. So this was uh, very interesting to see and this caused us to move the system off of a rolling table onto a fixed table, which improved our results, which I will talk about on the next slide. So we can see from these two plots that there is a rolling table measurements on the left from two data sets. And then on the right, we have our fixed footed table with three data sets. And so on the left, we have three points that are measuring exactly concurrently with each other. And on the right, we have four points that are concurrent. As well as that, we decreased our maximum spread from a two resolution element to a plus or minus one resolution element. On the left here, we have a uh, plot of all the wire, wish me wire widths measured along the entirety of a four inch grid sample. We start with the south quadrant, then we move to the west, north, and east quadrants in order. The important things to note here are that the system was able to uh, repeatedly capture a trend line of the wire widths along the um, progressing of the scan. So that gives us confidence that the, the system is able to accurately pick up the wire widths that are being measured. It's not completely random. Um, however, there are some outliers up here in the top left corner of the south and west quadrants. Um, those have to be acknowledged. However, there are two of these that have some form of repeatability to them. So there is a possibility that's a wire defect or a piece of dust on the grid. That's the scale that we're talking about measuring here, pieces of dust. On the right hand side, we see a distribution of all the wire widths that we measured from these five data sets. All the outliers are thrown into a one bin on the right so as to not skew the chart unnecessarily. And then we can also see that the west quadrant here I mentioned is significantly thinner um, than all the other quadrants. This lines up similar to what Team 1 found with their significant uh, transparency drop off where the wires got thicker. We're seeing that one of our quadrants is significantly thinner than the other three. Some conclusions that we learned. Um, our system operates with no video feed, no uh, video of any sort to the user. It is a purely text console window. So having a video feed available for the user and or operator to be able to visualize what's happening within the system uh, would be greatly beneficial. 
for uh, alignment and uh, positioning of the grid wires in a manual operating mode in particular. We learned that uh, laser-based measurement systems, uh, they pose many challenges. And uh, from our experience, not so many benefits uh, when compared to uh, imaging processing. Uh, so that, one, that one's on me, my bad. Uh, and then we learned that vibration isolation needs more research and testing. From our uh, initial results that we saw, there is room for improvement here. And so that's something that we'd like to look into more if we were to continue working on this project. Some further recommendations for future work. Uh, we were measuring our four inch grid, whereas team one was measuring a six inch grid and they mentioned the material differences there. We have a tungsten grid, there's a stainless steel. So for whatever reason, we are not quite sure. The stainless steel grid is not measurable by the laser system. We're not sure if that's a material property or a wire geometry issue, but we'd like to look into that more in the future. We would also recommend purchasing a very similar key and sensor unit that is able to perform a live video feed for the user as well as the operator to visualize what's happening underneath the laser scanning system. And lastly, we would like to uh, spend some time devoted to tracking down a software bug that causes random software freezes that are detrimental to the user's experience. And at this time, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Professor Guo, I'll get him. Again, congratulations. Um, so for one entire scan, right, how long does it take typically? About an hour. An hour? Yeah, one uh, hour. Uh, how, how many data points you collect? Um, about 500, 600. We measure um, at least eight times on every wire. However, we have to measure, um, we have to find the fillet first. So we're following the wire up to the fillet. Then we find the thick point of the fillet greater than a wire width and then we come back down off of it for those eight measurements. So in total, we're measuring 500, 600 times. Okay, and how many grids you test so far? Uh, like Team One, we only have one grid available for us for testing, um, so we've used that grid throughout all of our testing. Okay, did you compare to like baseline results so you see, you validate your results? Uh, yeah, in the backup slides we have a uh, it's down there. <laughs> uh, this, back to one more, that one. So this was a measurements from Capstone 1 when we were still looking at measuring transparency data of the grid, whereas we're now measuring just wire widths. Uh, and so these yellow, um, the yellow measurements are ours, and the blue measurements are measured at 192x optical magnification. And so we can see that throughout the majority of those measurements, we are uh, very close to um, the measurement value. Um, this chart is not exactly the one that I thought was in here. Um, there's one that we have that's better. Unfortunately, it's not here. I'm sorry. Uh, but from our measurements in the first semester of Capstone, we know that our, our system is close to the uh, absolute measurements. Okay, uh, from the chart, I can see the male is always a little bit overestimate of the width. That is correct. Okay, so you mentioned you you, know, you regret if you're using a visual camera system that will be better serve the purpose. It's very likely that uh, seeing the results achieved by Team One, that if we pursued a visual image based system, that we may have received better results. Yes. But definitely, you no. Know, as two teams, right? You want to try different track to see right which one is winner. At the beginning, there's no way to know it. Uh, I think <laughs> I think there's a clear winner here. <laughs> <laughs> at least at the beginning. So, <laughs> okay, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Guo. Again, beautiful work. Um, you you lost me on the chart with the. The x-axis was vibration analysis. Can you okay. go back to that? Sure. Um, what exactly is being measured there? Yeah. 
Uh, so this oh, I'm is, sorry, fre frequency of measurement is the x-axis. So the it's a Fourier transform on our acceleration data that's then double integrated to be displacement. So we're measuring um, okay. displacement in meters is what the scale is, but the range is zero to five micrometers on the vertical axis. And so uh, frequency of measurement is referring to um, the, the maximum, the, the most, most frequent measurement is at zero here going down. So our, our peak magnitudes are in that, that first uh, section there. Did that, did that clear that up or make it worse? I'm sorry. So, so you're doing a Fourier transform from the? From the raw acceleration data from yeah. the accelerometer. Okay, that's cool. And then um, in, the, in that very last slide that you had in, in the backup, sorry to go. That's all right. So, so there you're, you're saying you look through a microscope and you get the real numbers. That is correct. So the, those are the blue numbers. Yep. Okay. And, and so your device just makes it much faster. And automatic, yes. Right. Can you go to the next one for me? No. Uh, so this is a vibration isolation test that we did in Capstone 1, and we saw that there were significantly less vibrations, and that is noted because this measurement was taken straight off the floor of the workshop downstairs, so there was no um, external or in additional vibration caused by the legs of the table. Got it. And by the way, there's some gorgeous machining in there. Yeah, I do recommend everybody come up and take a look at yeah, both these systems. Yeah, there's gorgeous machine. A lot of nice parts in here. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much. Oh, okay. question? Yeah, I, I just want to say one thing about Team 2. Um, early on in EG498, um, even though we wouldn't admit it, Professor Rosner and I were, were hoping that they would choose different measurement methods, all right, as a means of, you know, exploring two avenues. Um, team two chose the more difficult method. Um, and I, I, I want to commend Jasper and his team for what they were able to accomplish with a sensor they bought off of eBay for $400 that lists new for $7,000. Uh, try 40,000. 40,000? 40 40K. Gee, I'm sure glad I didn't have to foot that bill. <laughs> so I, they, they, did, um, they did a magnificent job. And there's one thing, the one final thing I want to say about this is your sense or your team's sense to select the confocal laser, right, was appropriate because with an integral video feed, this system we'll be able to tell it where to go, and we'll be able to pick within a couple of microns where it is, and we'll be able to make the measurement right at the very thinnest portion of the wire. So we just gotta get that integral video going. So oh, for the low, low cost of 1500 to $2,000. <laughs> so again, uh, I commend uh, team two. They did a, a fantastic job. Thank you, everyone. All right, we're going to take a break. There's some refreshments in the back. And we'll reconvene in, uh, shall we say, 20 minutes? Thank you.
right, hello everybody. We're the uh, MFDRS team. Uh, presenting today will be myself, Travis Brody, along with uh, Troy Cody Ward. The other members of the team are Daniel Mondor, Jacob Heckman, and Michael Sears. So the agenda today, we're going to go over a project description, uh, system requirements and overview. Then we're going to get into the electrical and software integration. Uh, we're going to go through a system design, uh, looking closer at the sensor suite and control panel. And then finally, we're going to finish with a performance review. So this is the uh, SNHU Cessna 172R airplane. Uh, right now, it's used for data collection for aeronautical students to analyze in various flight dynamics classes. Uh, currently, there's a second generation miniature flight data recording system uh, in the airplane. And we were tasked with making a third generation flight data recording system. So the goal of our project was to make a new flight data recording system that maintained all the current uh, functions of the current one, as well as adding new functions and upgrading a few. Uh, some of the new functions that we wanted to add were a three-axis attitude measurement, uh, user-selectable recording time, uh, having two 20 by 4 character LCD displays, uh, an adjustable arm for moving the control panel to wherever the user needs, as well as a live data display. Uh, and we were trying to upgrade the data collection rate and quality, as well as um, allowing the system to be used by a single pilot or a pilot and a test conductor. And the control panel is removable from the system. So moving on to system requirements, uh, our driving requirements. Unfortunately, we did not meet all of these. The first one being the three-axis attitude measurement. Uh, we have a three-axis attitude uh, sensor able to measure orientation, but unfortunately it broke maybe two weeks ago, right before we started testing. So we never got to test it in the actual airplane. Um, the data recording rate, we were able to get that. Uh, our goal was one sample every 50 milliseconds. We were able to get it to one sample every 15 milliseconds, giving us a 70% margin. Um, the system does fit between the seats of the airplane and does not interfere with any controls on the airplane as long as the gooseneck arm is not attached. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the recording time being user selectable, uh, the user can choose when to start and stop recording, but preset times does not work right now. Um, it does not record data from all sensors because not all the sensors are working, as I said with the orientation sensor. Um, however, it does display data from multi or on multiple LCD displays, and that live data display is user selectable. So now going into a system overview. Uh, so this is the airplane and the sensors that uh, exist inside the airplane. So looking at the top right picture, the MFDRS system sits between the seats of the airplane and a little behind that there is a GPS receiver in the back. Uh, on the picture on the left, it points out where the string potentiometers are for the aileron, uh, rudder, and elevator. So the rudder and elevator are in the back of the airplane and the aileron is in the wing. Uh, those will be referred to as control surfaces throughout the rest of the presentation. And finally, the pitot and static air taps are uh, underneath the wing and on the side of the plane, respectively. So this is a functional block diagram of our system, just showing that all of those uh, sensors I just mentioned inside the plane uh, feed data into the sensor suite, and the sensor suite and control panel are um, communicating with each other. This is a more detailed look at our system. So looking at the left side, we have a 110 volt wall outlet um, that plugs into the power boost to charge the battery as needed. Uh, the battery and the power boost together power the system, which is controlled by an Arduino Due board. Uh, looking around the Arduino, you can see five sensors. Uh, each of those are transmitting and receiving data from and to the Arduino board. Uh, at the bottom there, we have the control surfaces um, sending data to the Arduino board. Uh, we have the pitot and static air going to the airspeed sensor, as well as the static air going to the altitude sensor. And on the top, you can see we have the control panel, all the components in that. So we have the power button here, rotary encoder, two buttons, and an LCD display, or two LCD displays. And finally, all of that data gets logged through a data logger shield into a, an SD card, or it is formatted into an Excel document. So this is the original MFDRS system. It was built by a company, Calspan, uh, professionally assembled and integrated. Um, it went through FAA approval process and has much cleaner wire management than we do. Uh, unfortunately, it only recorded raw data to a text file, and it doesn't have any display interface. Um, some of the sensors also broke in it, and they cannot be replaced without buying a new one that costs $70,000. So instead, 
Uh, we moved on to the second generation, which was made by Professor Karlstrom. It is a 3D printed sensor suite. Uh, it's a single LCD display that you can see in the picture on the right on the control panel. Uh, it can charge the battery with airplane power, uh, and it's controlled by an Arduino Mega. Uh, it takes uh, data, one sample, every 50 milliseconds. So this is our new MFDRS, the third generation that we made. Uh, the sensor suite is made of uh, aluminum. Uh, it's controlled by an Arduino Due board. It has two LCD displays, uh, an adjustable gooseneck arm, and it, it runs independently from airplane power. Now moving on to electrical integration. Uh, the main components in, this, uh, in the sensor suite and in the control panel are the Arduino Due board, the data logger shield, a custom circuit board that we made, uh, sensors, LCDs, buttons, a rotary encoder, and two RJ45 connectors to allow the sensor suite and control panel to communicate. So, looking a little bit more into our electrical subsystem. Um, so the system, as I said before, is controlled by an Arduino Due board. Uh, attached to that is a custom circuit board that we fabricated. You can see the schematic for that on the top right, and below that is the electrical PCB. Uh, when we were designing these, we had to take into account the size of the box. That had to stay the same, so we had to design the uh, circuit board to be uh, small enough to fit inside while still having all the necessary components. And we also had to um, take into account each of these sensors that we were going to put inside the sensor suite. So the sensors inside the sensor suite are the 9DOF sensor that measures three axis acceleration, uh, gyro rate, and magnetometer data. Uh, the BMP390 measures altitude and air pressure. And the orientation sensor measures three axis absolute orientation. All three of these are I squared C communication. Uh, and then more sensors, we have the GPS, which measures latitude, longitude, altitude, and speed. It is connected to the TX and RX pins and requires an external antenna which screws into this right here. Um, we have the airspeed sensor that measures differential pressure between the pitot and static air and converts it to airspeed. That's what these two tubes hanging out the back are. And finally, we have control surfaces. Uh, string potentiometers measure the angle of each control surface, and they're connected to the 15-pin connector on the back. So looking at a few more uh, components on the circuit board, on the top, the red component, we have the logic level shifter. So because the Arduino Due is a 3.3 volt logic level and the LCDs run on a 5 volt logic level, we needed the logic level shifter in order to allow them to communicate properly with each other. Uh, we also have the voltage reference, which just helps uh, regulate the voltage coming in from the control surfaces in order to get accurate uh, measurements out of those. And finally, we have the multiplexer all the way on the right. Uh, that's used to control two I squared C devices with the same address, which uh, were the LCDs in this case. So we had to make some custom electrical female connectors. Uh, they're made of a PLA plastic material, and they're connected to the circuit board, as you can see uh, in the picture on the bottom. So some of them are used to connect uh, various sensors to the circuit board. Uh, one of them is used to get a 3.3 volt signal from the Arduino board to the circuit board and to all the sensors. Uh, one of them is to connect the GPS to the circuit board, and another one is to connect the uh, analog reference pin, which is used in the calculations for the control surface. And finally, there's two on the right. Those connect to the 50-pin connector on the back and the power boost that powers the system. Now, moving on to software integration. Uh, the Arduino IDE software was used um, for the sensors. We originally tested the sensors individually using example codes that came with the libraries we had to download for each sensor. Uh, next, we you, um, we tested multiple sensors in the same code to ensure that they could work simultaneously with each other without getting messed up. Uh, next, we added this live data to an LCD display and added a button to make sure that we could switch between which sensor was being uh, showed on live data. And the recording menu uh, allows the user to choose between either timed or untimed recording using the rotary encoder by twisting it and pushing the button in it. And the code is about 1,600 lines long. So this is uh, two flow charts for our software. The one on the left is live data. That is the default option. So after the setup runs, it starts displaying live data from sensors. Um, each of the LCD displays displays something different. Um, it checks to see if the data recording menu has been pressed. That's this one here in the middle. Uh, if that button has been pressed, the data recording menu opens. Uh, we'll get into that. That's the flow chart on the right. Uh, if it hasn't been pressed, it continues to display live data. If the data button here, this one on the bottom, has been pressed, 
uh, the sensors that are being displayed on the LCDs change and it continues displaying that live data instead. Uh, looking at the recording menu, uh, once the recording menu is opened, the user is prompted to select between timed and untimed recording using the rotary encoder. Uh, if the timed option is selected, the user selects how long they want the recording to be, um, between 30 seconds and 300 seconds with five second intervals. Uh, once that's selected, the timer starts counting down. Uh, once it reaches zero or if the button is pressed again, the recording stops and it returns to the recording menu screen. Uh, if untimed recording is selected, it just tells the user, press the button again when you're ready to start and press it again to stop when the, you want to stop the recording. But it'll record indefinitely otherwise. All right, now I'm gonna pass it off to Troy to go over system design. Hello everyone, I'm going to be diving into our system design now. So this is an exploded view of our complete system altogether. As you can see, the sensor suite is on the bottom, which is integrated with the control panel on the top via the gooseneck subassembly, which we're gonna go into in the next slide. So as you can see with the pictures on the right, uh, they show the gooseneck assembly um, and how it integrates to the sensor suite, both in CAD and our actual manufactured product afterwards. There was some minor changes from our design to our manufactured product, mainly just for tooling and how the part needed to be machined. Um, basically, the arm adapter plate at the bottom screws into the lower side of the gooseneck arm, and that slides into the sliding mechanism on the top plate of the sensor suite. A threaded rod is inserted on both ends, which attaches them to both the plate and the control panel on the top. Uh, the pins that you can see in the bottom left corner picture they are used to fix the gooseneck into position once it has been slid in completely. Now we're gonna dive a little bit into our sensor suite design. So this is an exploded view of the sensor suite which you see on the bottom here of our system. As you can see in this exploded view, we did have M4 screws originally used for the top and M2.5 around all of the bottom fasteners. This changed uh, prior to manufacturing for a more uniform design, we went with M2.5 screws throughout the entire box. Um, at the top of each of the plates, you will see a uh, rectangular extruded piece. That is our fasteners, which the screws go into from the top plate in order to fasten them in. It is different than the base plate, which has an extruded ring design. Um, all of the side plates on the bottom go straight through into the base plate. This was to ensure that we did not have any screws on the bottom of the base plate for surface um, reasoning within the airplane. So this dives a little bit into the sensor placement within the sensor suite and how they actually were integrated. So the 9DOF uh, sensor is integrated on the top plate of the box. It uh, has the x-axis facing towards the front of the box. We also use the sidewalls for each of these sensors in order to properly align them for measurement purposes. Um, the altitude sensor is placed on the opposite side of the top plate, which is different than previous designs. This is largely due to the fact that we have screws going in from the top plate now, so we had less spatial uh, that we could use. Um, the orientation sensor is mounted on the side plate on an L-shaped bracket. Um, this also, each sensor was integrated, uh, fastened to the 3D printed pieces via heat set threaded inserts. This was to ensure that proper fastening was um, done at all times throughout the flight and that none of the sensors would fall off. Um, a level was used when we were implementing the orientation sensor. This was pivotal to its functionality within the system as it needs to be perfectly flat in order to work properly. Um, the airspeed sensor is connected directly to the board and the GPS is mounted to the Arduino assembly via some pin connectors. This goes a little bit more in detail of how the Arduino assembly and circuit board assembly are integrated into our system. So as you can see in the top right picture, we have some 3D printed supports that were used in order to uh, integrate it to the box itself. Um, differently than the other 3D printed parts, we actually had to use self-tapping screws for these instead of the heat set threaded inserts. This was due to the lack of material that we actually had on these parts. They're very small. So if we were to use the heat set threaded inserts, they would deform the part or break it completely. Uh, the Arduino assembly also has a micro USB that needs to be accessed at all times from the outside of the box in order to upload code to the system. And the SD card needs to be able to be removed at all times in order to export the data from the system. 
Um, this being said, we have two slot cutouts on the front of the box that you guys can see right here. And this makes it so that you can have easy access without having to take anything apart on the box itself. This is our battery assembly. So it's implemented with a 3D printed frame which attaches to the top plate via four screws and two nuts on each side. This was implemented uh, to prevent falling um, of the battery which would cause damage to the sensors within the system. So meaning you, can, you have to take apart the entire top plate in order to unscrew the nuts that are underneath meaning that it won't be directly above the sensors when you're taking it off. It's also accessible through the top plate via the battery cover that we have that's screwed in with four screws on each corner. And there's padding implemented around the entire 3D part to reduce vibration impacts during flight. And this is the power boost that we used within our system. It is used to power the system independently from airplane power, as well as regulating the power that goes to the system itself. Similarly to the Arduino assembly, it also has a micro USB port which has to be accessed from the outside of the box. So we use a similar slot cutout on the opposite side. And now we're going to dive into our control panel design a little bit. So this is an exploded view of our control panel. As mentioned previously, all of the other 3D printed parts aside from those supports that we mentioned are implemented or fastened using the heat set threaded inserts as you can see in that design right there. This is a brief overview of what you are actually seeing on this control panel here. In the top, you guys will see the power button right here that is used to turn the system on and off. The rotary encoder opens up the data recording menu, or actually, I'm sorry, it selects options that can be changed within the data recording menu. The button below it is what selects the data recording menu, and the bottom button changes the data that is being displayed on the screens itself. There are two 20 by 4 LCD displays which display the live data being recorded from the system. And the RJ45, which is mounted with these wires right here, allow for the sensor suite to communicate with the control panel. This is inside the control panel with our control panel base. The RJ45 is mounted via some 3D printed supports as well that also have heat set threaded inserts in them. The threaded rod on the bottom that you guys can see in the bottom left picture is how we connect it to this gooseneck assembly. And finally, the wire management elbows that you see on the left are similar to what a household vacuum cleaner use. And that is basically just to make sure that we do not have too much loose wire within the system. We're going to go through a quick deep dive of our performance review of our system. So this is the first test we did. It was in about January or so. It's our dynamic test. This was done with a breadboard setup within a moving vehicle. It was traveling at less than 45 miles per hour on mainly back roads, so there were some bumps and potholes. Uh, this was mainly performed to ensure that uh, all the sensors collected accurate data within a moving vehicle. Um, during this test, one sample was collected every 100 milliseconds, and it mainly tested the 9DOF and altitude sensor, as you can see from the graphs on the right. Those graphs also did show us that we, need, we needed further calibration of our sensors as the top graph with the acceleration was extremely noisy and provided pretty decent data, but very noisy. And the altitude had a dip off in the middle, which we were trying to assess through further calibration. This was the fit check that we did within the airplane. So this was mainly to check whether the gooseneck was going to interfere with both the pilot's use of the plane as well as their vision of the controls within the plane. After it was installed, it was deemed that it was indeed in causing an interference with both the pilot's use of the plane controls as well as vision of the plane controls. This would be mitigated using a smaller gooseneck in the future. But with that being said, we are also able to use our system without the gooseneck when handheld version, which is what we did for the remaining tests for the semester. This is our airplane integration test. It was done to um, test the fully integrated system within its operating environment. There's various tests that were done during this test, such as a slow constant speed test, acceleration test, and a fast taxi test. And the accelerometer and control surface data showed us the best results. As you can see on the right, that is our acceleration data from one of our acceleration trials. This is when the plane was at rest before a quick acceleration, and then back to an abrupt stop at the end. 
Our final test that we did about a couple days ago, actually, uh, was our flight test. So this was where the box, the integrated suite was put into the airplane and various conditions were tested, including a climb to 3,700 feet, various bank tests, which include wiggling the plane from left to right, that test the uh, roll rate and yaw. The gyro test, descent and landing tests. Throughout these tests, we did see that some tensor sensors did not record data, such as airspeed, and um, the, some of the sensors also recorded inaccurate data, such as the accelerometer and uh, GPS. The accelerometer was very noisy, such as other tests that we had seen previously and throughout the semester. And the GPS did indicate where it had started from its position, but it did not have a difference from where it ended. And this is a brief overview of our verification matrix. So this shows all the um, requirements that we were able to meet, as well as the ones that we were not able to meet. As you can see, there is a handful of requirements that we were not able to complete by the end of the semester. And this is a review of our budget. So SNU provided us with $3,000 at the beginning of the year in order to produce our system. It took us about $1,800 to be able to produce what we have for you today, which is also far less than the $70,000 that it took CalSpan to implement a very similar system. So this is a quick look at our schedule. So we were able to complete all of our tasks Aside from integrating our software, which was not completely done, considering that we do have a couple sensors that need further debugging. And these are some of our lessons learned, which there were many of them throughout the year. <laughs> um, one being, uh, we would have gone with a more strict schedule, which could have helped uh, give us more time to uh, debug the unexpected errors that we had, as well as it would have made it so that we could have integrated our complete system earlier and found a lot of the flaws and been able to address them properly. We also think that we could have utilized the resources provided to us a lot better through um, SNU. This being said, managing time more efficiently, there was time where we thought we had a lot more downtime than we actually had, so we were just sitting around when we should have been working a lot harder than we were. Um, this goes with tasks taking twice as long. So when we did get to doing those tasks, we would often plan for them to take about a day, and it would be pushed to about a week. So that adds up by the end of the semester. Finally, we were also able to practice some engineer to machinist dialogue. This was extremely important, as this was the first project where we were able to, as designers, be talking to machinists and basically implement our system the way that we want to and make sure that our drawings are being interpreted correctly. Some future improvements that we would uh, say should be necessary for the next generation of the MFDRS system would be to increase data quality of both the airspeed sensor as well as the GPS. We'd also like to seek FAA approval to be able to test the gooseneck arm assembly within the plane itself during a flight test. One of our original requirements uh, was to integrate outside air temperature, which through further research, we found that it would be too much for our uh, team to be able to integrate. We would like to integrate that into the next system so that it would be a more robust system. Reassessing wire management, um, we, did, we were hoping to have a much tighter wire management system so that way we had nothing free flowing like the way that you guys see it here. We do believe that could be reassessed and would produce a lot better system, looking system in the end. Um, finally, a more user friendly sensor suite design. So there was a couple things that uh, post machining that we saw that we definitely would have liked to address, such as what you see in the top right corner. That is the battery plate that is supposed to be accessible through the top plate so that you can get to the battery. Um, at the moment, it's kind of like a press fit plate. So in order for you to pop that plate off, you actually have to take the entire top plate off and push it from underneath, meaning that it's kind of useless at the moment. And now I'd like to open the floor to any questions that you guys may have. You mentioned the noise factor before. What would you do in the future uh, if you had more time to address that? Probably find a better accelerometer. Is that the only cause of it, just the accelerometer yeah, quality? Yeah, mostly the accelerometer that we found all that noise on. Okay, all right, thank you. So I have a question uh, regarding that 
that same point. And I don't know the mounting of the accelerometer well enough, but is it possible that internal dynamics are being picked up by the accelerometer? Yeah, that's possible. So that mounting it, the inside structure of that box may be a way to mitigate the, in other words, it may not be the sensor that's noisy, it may be, but it, it could just be the way it's mounted. So that's just a hypothesis that could easily be tested, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I mean, accelerometers are noisy, even the current one is pretty noisy, but that's noisier. Oh, yeah? So we have completed the software that a flight control test in the dynamic course, and the acceleration is uh, nor, not so noisy, it's very smooth. So you are using the same system, what is provided by the airport? Uh, we have a different accelerometer in there that we think is a little more sensitive to vibrations that would cause it to have more noisy data. Oh, I see. OK, thank you. It looks like you utilize a lot of sensors, right? I noticed that at the end, some sensor didn't work. And uh, I found out right, there's a lot of uh, things we could learn from it is one, once you got a sensor, first thing first, you got to check the spec sheet. Make sure, right, the spec is what you expected. And second, you have a doubt, you do ground testing, right? For example, accelerometer, you can put on a a shaker, right? You know, you you know the pattern of acceleration on a shaker, so you can match, right? The accelerator, uh, accelerometer readings with the shaker uh, expected acceleration um, values, so that you can compare them, right? Again, you no know, test, test, and test is the key here. I know, right? You've been delayed in at the very end, but you know, I wish you could do more tests throughout the way. Yeah, we do too. Just a quick, <coughs> excuse me, just a quick one. What's the difference between a Arduino Mega and the Due? Um, the main difference that we were looking for was the Arduino Due is a bit faster. The one drawback that we found was that it has a 3.3 volt board, but they have the same uh, pin configuration. They're pretty similar overall. Thank you. So I just had a quick question about the SD card that you guys mentioned. So your system will automatically output to an Excel such that a test conductor can go up and walk away right there with an SD card that has the data ready to process? Yes. Any other questions? Thank you. So we're the uh, t we're team three, the uh, SAE uh, competition team, and I'm Paul. 
I'll be presenting with Rob, and we've got Rashid, Christian, and Jordan on our team. So just going over uh, the agenda, what we're going to be looking at is just the overall project description, why we're doing what we're doing, uh, look at the major system requirements of our aircraft, um, go over the design and what it looks like and uh, some of the decisions we made, look at the fabrication integration that we went through, and then look at the tests that we've done, tests that we still need to do, look at our budget, look at some recommendations uh, for future designs and maybe future teams that wanted to compete in this competition, and then we'll open the floor to any questions y'all might have. So we are, the intent of this design is to compete in the SAE International Aero Design East competition, uh, which will be held next month in Austin, Texas. And you can just see the, uh, this is the flight, predicted flight circuit for our class. So the SAE hosts uh, annual competitions, and this is one of them. And within that competition, there are different categories of aircraft. And we've chosen the micro class, which defines the size and the rules and the flight circuit that it'll do. So we just got a satellite image of this. And just go through the flight circuit. You'll start off taking off a platform that's eight feet long and two feet off the ground. Do a 300 foot sprint as fast as you can, and that'll be timed. And then complete the flight circuit and land in a 200 foot long landing zone. So the next one, so going over the major requirements, the majority of these are dictated by the SAE. Um, in their rules, and some of them are derived, such as the weight requirement that we have of 4.5 pounds. That's a goal we wanted to achieve based on the analysis for taking off that short runway, so that's a very important part of the, uh, the competition. Unfortunately, we didn't, with the current build, we didn't meet that weight limit. We are uh, with a negative margin of 7%. Um, and then for functional and performance requirements, one of those is staying under 450 watt power limit. And that's done using a supplier uh, power limiter. And we have achieved that. And we've also achieved the capability of carrying two different types of payload, a 12 by 12 by 2 inch box, and metal payload plates within the aircraft. And some three more uh, requirements that we uh, are looking to achieve. Again, we haven't been able to flight test yet due to the weather. Uh, there's been some too strong winds to fly this week, so we're looking to the end of the week to our first flight test. Um, and so we haven't been able to see if it is able to do that full flight circuit or if it's able to take off that uh, platform. Um, but the obviously the physical aspect we have met. And just kind of give you an idea, you can see the design in front of you, but just to get a sense of the components that go into the uh, design and some of the materials that we used for it and the configuration. So overall, the configuration is a high wing, so that means the wing is on top of the fuselage. And then we have a single motor, uh, single nose landing gear that is steerable, which is a requirement, requirement for this competition. And then a double boom configuration, where you have two booms supporting the uh, vertical stabilizers and the horizontal stabilizers. And you can just see kind of the placement of the uh, control surfaces, two ailerons, an elevator, uh, no rudder, thanks to the double uh, vertical stabilizer configuration. And then you can just see in the front, there's an access hatch to access all the electrical components in the back to access the payload uh, box. And then uh, the materials is made of is uh, foam wing, a foam horizontal stabilizer, some 3D printed parts, and then carbon fiber fuselage uh, that we made. And so a big uh, part of the design is choosing the airfoil. And so we did that based off the um, the CL Max at the uh, 12 degree uh, standing angle of attack when it's when it's uh, when it's not moving at takeoff, and so you can just see the camber of the uh, the main wing and then the symmetrical wing for the horizontal and vertical stabilizers, and then a huge part of the design process is looking at the scoring equation that we're given, which you can see right here, and trying to optimize that. So just kind of go over the equation. Uh, it looks at the weight of your payload plates, so the metal, metal payload plates that we can choose how much to include, and we've decided to do half a pound. And then there's the bonus score, which is based on your selection of a, either a large or small box, and you can choose how many you want it to do. And we've decided to go with one large box. Um, and then the T-flight, that is the time it takes for to do the 300-foot uh, sprint. And so it's really been a balance of finding the fastest airplane while also carrying the most payload. And we've tried to go with a very lightweight design. Um, 
through our material selection and just configuration. Um, so some of you who were here for the winter CDR presentation will, uh, this will be a pretty different design than what we presented. And we really pivoted this spring to a new design. Um, and the reason we did that, because the previous one was a very non-conventional flying wing tailless aircraft. Um, and the reason we switched was due to wind tunnel testing of a 3D printed model and some simulation analysis that uh, it didn't give us confidence that we could achieve stable flight and controllable flight with that design. So we pivoted to more traditional aircraft uh, that we have more confidence in that it will be stable in flight. Um, some of the things we did retain from the previous design are the electrical components, the motors uh, primarily, and some of the material selection. Uh, just going over some predicted performance of the aircraft. So our lift to drag rate, maximum lift to drag ratio, our maximum takeoff weight. Again, we already talked about that one. Uh, big one is the th is the thrust with this particular motor and propeller combination. We're looking at about uh, four pounds of thrust, um, right under that 450 watt limit of 441 watts. And then our uh, takeoff ground uh, takeoff run uh, with a two mile per hour headwind. We're looking at about 18 feet and then one, one foot vertical drop off that uh, eight foot table. And then also a big part of it is this battery selection, which we've changed slightly over the course of the design. And with this particular battery, we uh, are able to do a full, full flight circuit, what we predict will be a full flight circuit, with using about half of the usable charge, which is only 13% of the full battery, but we, you want to limit the amount of drain you do on the battery to prevent damage. And then just looking at our flight score, looking at 11 for one flight and the maximum speed of 44 miles per hour, we predict. And just the lap time is about 50 seconds. Then moving to fabrication. So uh, the major components are obviously the wings, the fuselage. And so the wings, we made it, decided to make a foam. And a big part of that is getting that the intricate cut of the airfoil. And so we use a CNC foam cutting machine that we have in this building and then doing the detail cuts for weight reduction and for uh, mounting hardware. And then there are also the carbon fiber fuselage pieces, which you see here. Um, those were made using 3D printed molds and then a wet layup technique and then doing detail cuts for all the mounting of the hardware. And there are various 3D printing components uh, throughout, such as the vertical stabilizers. Uh, just to give you an idea of the uh, iterative design that we went through, uh, one example is the landing gear, is a nose landing gear. Um, going from version one to two, version one's not here, but it's just a wheel geometry change. And then um, just as we were putting everything together, seeing how it, how it went together and how it worked, being able to quickly, with 3D printing, able to quickly change the design and uh, make a more robust and strong landing gear, uh, doing some quick FEA analysis. Uh, just another look at the fabrication. So you can see the foam cutting on the far left there. Uh, CNC foam cutting, you just see the, uh, just getting that airfoil shape was very important. And so we were able to achieve that with the CNC uh, foam cutting. You can see, get an idea of the carbon fiber wet layup technique that we use in 3D printed molds. And then the result of those parts after some trimming, although they aren't, they aren't, this isn't their finished state, but that is almost the finished state. We did run into some challenges to the fabrication. If you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so you can see in that, that picture is a scrap wing. We had to scrap that wing. Um, so the foam was probably the hardest part to manufacture and um, get right. And part of that was the CNC foam cutter, just trying to dial that in and determine the best uh, cutting speed and temperature of that wire. Uh, that, that took us a long time. That uh, did cause some delays in our uh, manufacturing. We also did not fully understand the material, so we did use the wrong glue while trying to apply the main spar underneath it. And you can see that's what happened there when the glue pretty much melted through the wing. So we ran into that problem, had to redo the wing. And another problem was applying a coating. So traditionally for RC airplanes, you apply a monocoat, and that pretty much is like a shrink wrap, shrink, shrink wrap almost, that creates um, an aerodynamic surface. And unfortunately, due to the heat sensitivity of the foam uh, and the lack of adhesion of the Monaco, we were, had to uh, switch to a, just a clear uh, tape coating for that. And we saw the foam as kind of a simple alternative to traditional balsa setup of a wing, but we realized just because it seemed simple, it, uh, it had its own challenges that we didn't anticipate. 
So moving to the electrical system, so you can just see the electrical schematic over here and then what it looks like um, in the aircraft. Just get a sense of like the flight controller, all the servos. And in the next slide, we'll see the uh, kind of the, the flow of operations of the, of the electrical system. And the, you won't see the top part. The flash controller is just for the programming purposes and is removed for flight. So we'll just go to the next slide. We can just see starting with the power source, we get 14.8 volts from the battery. Moving to the arming plug, which is removed, um, which is actually which is attached before flight, kept off for safety. Moves to the power limiter, which is a supplier part, and then moves to the ESC and to the motor, the ESC which controls the motor, and the ESC also provides the five volt battery to the flight controller, which is pretty much the brains of the uh, of the aircraft, and it controls all our servos for all our control surfaces and our nose landing gear. And then the flight controller receives the information from the transmitter, which you see right there. Next slide. So after we finished fabrication and integrating the electrical system, it was uh, time to integrate the uh, aircraft structure. So that included the tail, the tail structure, getting all those components together, and also setting up all the, uh, the control services for the ailerons and the elevators and hooking those up and making sure they worked and testing those. Um, and then after that, it was attaching everything to the fuselage and integrating all the electrical components. And you can see what we have is the current design uh, right in front of you. There were some changes from the design, such as the landing gear I talked about, also for the nose landing gear, but also some cl adding clearance height for the prop to make sure we didn't strike it on takeoff or landing, replacing the monocoat with the clear tape, and then um, opting for smaller and lighter uh, control surface components since weight reduction was a key part of the iterative design. And the major deviation, obviously, was the weight um, that we had. And so we're going to start doing a just quick demonstration of the control services and then show a short video of a taxi test.
see there, we gave it a little bit more throw, and it definitely wants to take off. Um, we're, we're pretty excited to move into flight testing, hopefully, uh, later this week. So now I'll go into a little bit of our uh, takeoff analysis and move through some of the testing that we still have yet to do uh, before competition later in May. Um, you see that, as Paul mentioned earlier, we have a, a two-foot platform that we have to take off that's eight feet long. Um, we, if we have no headwind, we don't believe that we'll be able to do that with our performance analysis. You can see we would need a vertical drop of about three and a half feet before we would achieve a speed where we would start any kind of vertical acceleration. So uh, looking at about one or two mile per hour headwind, which is likely the, in, the, in the event that we have zero mile per hour headwind uh, it is, is pretty unlikely. In the SAE, they told us that they would direct our takeoff um, preferably into a headwind as best they could. Um, so the likelihood of having zero is low. Uh, however, if there is none, we would likely hit the ground. You see. Uh, hopefully we could get a two mile per hour headwind or greater and that's where most of our analysis numbers come from. Um, and then at a six mile per hour headwind we would have zero vertical drop and we believe that we would be able to take off of that eight foot platform uh, but that would be confirmed during flight testing. So tests already conducted. Um, you see some in green and the ones in white yet have not started. All the ones in uh, white are just with the clear background. Those are, can't be done in, until we can get it in the air. Hopefully again later this week, weather kind of in, uh, prohibit us from doing it earlier this week. And you see in, in the red, we did go over weight, as Paul mentioned, at the 4.83 instead of the 4.5. And that was a limit we put on ourselves, uh, but it, it will cause us some performance issues again uh, if there's no headwind. So our test flow, we've completed all of our integrated electrical system testing and our ground test that you saw the short video of a moment ago. So next we'll be moving into flight testing and I'll talk about each of these uh, in a little bit more detail uh, moving into the next slides. So earlier uh, Paul mentioned the, the Monaco and, and how some of that, we had some of that trouble. Uh, we didn't believe that we were going to have this problem earlier in the semester. Uh, we did test the monocoat on a smaller piece of foam, with, uh, and, and that feasibility test was successful, but as soon as we tried to do it on a larger scale, that's when we started running into more of the heating problem, the adhesion problem. Uh, it was melting when we would apply the heat uh, that's necessary to get the monocoat to shrink and form to the surface. Um, so just wanted to illustrate that you know, we, we did believe that would work, and we did test it, uh, but on the large scale, it, it um, did not work. Again, our, uh, our electrical system testing, uh, Paul mentioned we did do a couple iterations on the battery and that was when we started to realize that we were going to come over our weight budget of 4.5 pounds. Uh, we were able to find another battery that weighed about an ounce less than the original battery that we wanted to use, which is of a higher quality. Um, so we definitely did some, some robust testing of this new battery and it was able to still deliver the same amount of power that we needed uh, for the durations that we needed, which would be three complete flight circuits. Uh, and our propeller selection also changed. The first propeller uh, that we chose was a nine inch diameter with a six inch pitch. And the pitch is kind of the angle from the, the tip to the back of one blade. Um, and that can vary your top speed. Uh, we chose a nine by six with only two blades originally. Uh, and then after testing this three blade configuration, we were able to get more thrust from it, which plays into our acceleration and is, is key for this competition as, again, that eight foot runway, we need to accelerate as fast as possible. So a little bit of summary of, of what we've completed is the integrated electrical testing. We've done our ground testing and our motor and battery performance has all been verified. Um, the power limiter, we had a little bit of, of trouble with that. The first one, we decided to try and use that to limit our power draw. And I believe that we fried the circuit on it because we just ran straight into the power limit just to see how it would behave. Um, then we had to wait for more to be shipped to us uh, once that circuit was fried. And after that, we decided to limit our power draw 
um, ourselves by a software. So we won't even touch the limit of the power limiter in, uh, at all. So our flight test plan uh, moving into later this week, weather permitting, is to first do a glide test. Uh, that would be with the control surfaces operable, but the motor would not be turned on just to uh, verify the aerodynamics of the aircraft. And then we'll move into a ground takeoff, uh, not off of any platform, uh, both in an unloaded and loaded configuration. You can see the method and success criteria here on your right. After uh, completion of successful ground takeoffs, we'll move into testing ourselves off of our own platforms. We're, instead of starting at a, uh, a two-foot platform, we're going to start at a four-foot platform to give ourselves a little bit more margin since we are expecting a little bit of a drop if we have a headwind of less than six miles per hour. Now we'll move into budget, uh, some lessons learned, and some recommendations for uh, future improvements to our design. Our overall budget, as uh, with the other teams, was 3000 at the start of last semester. We ended up spending a little over 2200 and have a remaining uh, balance of 740 We don't expect to be spending any more, so this is our final budget. Uh, we did go over our hardware, hardware budget, but that was well absorbed uh, with our uh, seeing that we didn't uh, exceed the overall budget. Recommendations for future, you see these, uh, these booms in the back, these are carbon fiber stock booms and they are heavier than balsa so we would replace those with balsa to save weight. Um, and another big one is the vacuum bagging technique for the carbon fiber. During the wet layup technique you lay, lay some fiber down in a mold and you pour some resin over it and spread it out and let it dry. A uh, vacuum bag is exactly what it sounds like. You would subject it to a vacuum where it would pull all of the resin out of that so you don't have any excess resin, but you'd still maintain the same structural integrity. Uh, that technique is, is, is more difficult, and, and we didn't take the time to learn that, but that is something that we would have spent more time on uh, if we were to rebuild or redesign this, this aircraft. And then, uh, again, more, more thorough feasibility testing on the coating uh, for foam. Some lessons learned for our project. We uh, definitely want to do some, some in-depth project planning and some uh, requirements tracking. There were some specific uh, requirements by the SAE that we were aware of at the beginning of Capstone 1 that kind of fell to the wayside. Um, and as, our, as we started to, to design the aircraft, we're kind of stomping our feet. Oh, I forgot, forgot about that one. We got to change this design real quick. Maybe move the arming plug back because it needs to be six inches behind the propeller. Just little, little things that would have been simple um, had we done more thorough requirements tracking throughout the uh, two semesters of Capstone. Um, and I think that plays a little bit into time management and task delegation as well. And uh, team communication. Uh, communication definitely seems to be a trend that, that could always be improved, whether it's Capstone or industry. Um, but communication and, and frequent meetings it's definitely key to the, to the success of uh, engineering projects. And then again, the comprehensive feasibility testing uh, in reference to the monocote. The monocote uh, worked on small scale, but not on large scales. I'll open it up to questions. Any questions? If you... Um don't have headwinds at the competition. Is there anything, any modifications or anything you do to the aircraft to give it more, help it nose up or something and sooner or not drop as much? Not knowing the aerodynamics, but. Uh, without uh, putting a fan in front of it, I'm not sure <laughs> what we would be able to do. Um, I can tell you that the deflection of the elevator in the back, that definitely plays into it. So we're going to start with a negative degree angle there, um, and which is, which is also why we chose to not put the stabilization uh, that the flight controller has the capability of doing on the elevator itself, because that gives us a little bit more um, degrees of deflection there. But you couldn't elongate, you couldn't make it bigger or something? The control surface? Yeah. 
Um, Christian. Some of the key things that we tried to tackle with reducing the weight were increasing the acceleration or the thrust that we have, decreasing the mass, and decreasing the friction between the wheels and the, and the um, runway, essentially. So we've tackled, we tried to tackle almost all three of those, and we've reached a limit of the weight reduction in the mass with respect to that. Um, we tried to maximize as much thrust we can get with different propeller types with the limited amount of uh, wattage we can get. And finally, we also tackled the uh, wheels and the landing gear problem. Um, however, at this point in time, those are the only three that we've tackled specifically to increase the chances of us uh, taking off the platform. And we're, all, we're obviously more open to any other ideas that people may have other than the top three that I just mentioned. I have a question, or, or no, I'll put it in the form of a question. You mentioned that your first test off runway would be a higher, eight, whatever feet up, so that you have room to recover in case it turns out you need more height. That, that sounds a bit backward to me. It sounds like somebody's afraid to dive off the edge of the pool because they don't know how, it's gonna, how they're going to feel. Therefore, they're going to try the high board first to make sure they have enough time in the air to get themselves ready. Another, if I may, a suggestion would be this. So the first time you come off a table like that, you might consider putting a ramp at the end of it. So that in case it doesn't fly, it's rolling down a ramp rather than crashing. And you could, if it works, you could make the ramp steeper next time to see if it now flies off, ultimately getting to an angle which it will fly. That way you can mitigate the risk of you crashing, and if you crash, you have difficulty recovering from that. You know, that structure is not meant to survive a crash. Just something to think about. You start with the level ground, which is your plan anyway, but then your first, first eight-foot runway, if you will, could be as high as you want as long as you have, or as low as you want, as long as you had a ramp at a shallow angle at first to see how it behaves in doing that drop. Just a, something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you for the suggestion. What? Question there. What stands for the MSCA? NACA. In the on table emission. Is it an abbreviation? Yeah, NSCA? Is it as a predecessor example? Yeah. Oh, I see. OK. And um, did you approach any analysis using the uh, software, like any finite element based or any numerical software, like uh, angle of attack? Yes, we did. So for most of the stability analysis and the flight analysis, we used a program called XFLR5, which is a free uh, open software that we can use. And we've tried our best to model the geometry of the aircraft to that software. However, uh, we've been seeing the limits uh, and the capabilities of the software. So there are definitely performance issues that uh, we are not able to address. And there's also definitely some unknowns as to how the aircraft may perform because we're not able to see the full capabilities of uh, the software uh, that we're given. However, yes, we have used software to analyze the performance of our aircraft. OK. So I, I know you, so last semester you came up with the design. Essentially, you start from scratch again this semester. So what makes you change that design? So one of the biggest things, like I mentioned earlier, was the uh, we, were leech, we were reaching the full capabilities of software that we were using. And with that design, we didn't know, for example, how far um, we could get uh, 
Um, how do I explain this? For example, for the flying wing, the, we weren't able to see the full uh, lifting capabilities such that we weren't able to see how it performed, for example, a coefficient versus alpha uh, degree uh, polar graph. We weren't able to see where it would stall, where we weren't able to see how, um, to what extent it would stall to do what angle. So between that and in combination to the other performance character characteristics that would give us that um, inability to see what it would do, we scrapped that project as fast as we could as a team to come up with a design in less than four months. Um, but, yeah. Okay. So essentially lack of analysis capability, yeah. right? So that your design is now you know, verified until, right? Until it's too late. That is correct. Okay. My second question is, uh, could you explain why you not utilize a rudder uh, in your design? So after, so during the first, during the early part of the semester, during January, we were really concerned with trying to go on with the competition such that we would have a full, complete design. And we thought that if we reduced the analysis such that we wouldn't have a rudder and we would just focus on some of the other major performance characteristics that we would have enough confidence between the uh, um, the two rudders. We we would we thought that we would have enough confidence in that um, to move forward. So to answer your question, we didn't have a rudder because we wanted to essentially descope or decrease the complexity so that we would have a working product by the end of the um, end of the semester. Okay. Um, Another question is about the payload. You're supposed to carry what kind of payload and where it, it goes to, to the airplane? So for SAE, we were tasked to carry two types of payloads, one of them being a 12 by 12 by 1 inch box that would be located between the fuselage. And we have another payload, which consists of two payload plates located at the front, uh, essentially front housing, which is located in the side. If you'd like to take a closer look, please go ahead. Okay, that's my question. Thank you. Yep. To Professor Gold's point, didn't you also have indications from your wind tunnel test that stability of that original design would be uh, problematic? Mm. So for a wind tunnel test, the only data we were able to get that would that we thought would be accurate was the uh, lifting capabilities versus the um, velocity that we're going at. Um, so we tried to compare that to the simulation data we have from XFLR5 compared to the export data from the wind tunnel, and we uh, we saw that it was fairly accurate to a point. For so for example, um, we were only able to find the analysis or lifting capabilities for our flying wing from like an angle of attack of zero to uh, five degrees. And we saw that similar trend such that when we compare the data, it would show um, that the data we'd get from the wind tunnel is, is fairly reflective from the XFLR5 simulation. So we thought that with the help of wind tunnel and the simulation, we came to a conclusion that the aircraft was not stable with that respect. Um, and incapable of producing some of the results or performance that we needed. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Somebody should, somebody should have mentioned that unlike the other three teams, this team isn't done. The competition is in a month in Texas. And they've all committed to proceeding out to do their to do their uh, competition. Hopefully, after they again, hopefully, graduate next week. <laughs> so, if they don't graduate, if they don't make it, there's no problem. They'll be going out to Texas. If they do graduate, then their employers hopefully will let them go to Texas. I'd like to thank everybody. This was. Uh, a, a welcome change from the last three years of watching a two-dimensional screen for everything uh, and not seeing anybody's face for real. So I want to thank all the students, all the guests, all the faculty, uh, all the deans. 
and uh, we're back on track. Thank you very much.